But today we have a very interesting book. If you see the cover of this book, it says Historical and Critical Dictionary. And a little extended title there by Peter Bale, B-A-Y-L-E, in four volumes. This is only volume one. And it says London, 1826. Two interesting things about this are Peter Bale wasn't really his name. He was a French guy. He was Pierre Bale. The other thing is 1826, this was a very old book. It was over 130 years old at that time. Uh, Pierre Bale and Louis XIV kind of started the, the Enlightenment. Louis XIV did it by uh, being an authoritarian and kind of, kind of not a pleasant guy to live, live under if you had a kind of a, a, a wandering mind of a, of a philosopher. And Pierre Bale fled France and went to, uh, to Holland and uh, started working on this book there. He, it was originally intent, it's called, sometimes called the Dictionary of Errors. And he was, he was trying to be Snopes.com a little bit ahead of time. He was going to write a, a book that included all the false stories that circulate. And then when you heard a story, if you didn't know if it was true or not, you could look in the book. And if you didn't find the story, you, wouldn't, you would know it wasn't an error and that it was absolutely true. But he, he talked to his friends a little bit while he started on that project. Yes. And it turned out to be something a little bit different. And uh, this was one of the first books that the salon societies and coffee houses and all started to, to um, discuss. And we have here the reading on Abel. The first murder originated in the first religious dispute. The Targum of Jerusalem relates that Cain and Abel, being in the field, the former asserted that there was no judgment nor judge, nor life eternal, nor rewards for the good, nor punishment for the wicked, and that the world was neither created nor governed by the goodness of God. For, says he to his brother, my oblation was not received, but yours was. Abel answered him in his own words, substituting only the affirmative for the negative. And as to his principal complaint, his answer was that his works being better than those of Cain were the occasion of the preferences given to his offering. The disputes growing warm, Cain fell upon Abel and slew him. This was the impious, be impious beginning of disputes in religion and a fatal pr presage of the terrible confusions they were to cause in the world. It affords us likewise an in instance of a foolish vanity of man who is never so much led to doubt of a providence as when things do not succeed according to his wishes. Give him prosperity, his doubts vanish. The reason is that he thinks he holds too considerable a rank in the universe to be overlooked by an equitable and judicious dispenser of good and evil. I acknowledge ye, O ye gods, cried Statius, when Rutilius Gallicus, a man of distinguished honesty, had recovered from a dangerous disease. On the contrary, if anything fell out which they did not like, the ancients either denied the being of the gods or charged them with cruelty and injustice. Hence Ovid, upon the death of Tibullius, whoops, turned too many pages there, when matched by cruel fate, the good and just perish and sink untimely to the dust. May I the bold confession be forgiven. I almost think there are no gods in heaven. This is the language of one of the best orators of the 16th century. Kevin Fitz. A mental health advocate who has suffered dozens of mental health crises remembers leaving one hospital after being in the psych ward for four days. I was not connected to services. I did not have a case manager or a skills trainer or a peer specialist to help me navigate any of these, he said. It was just, okay, thank you. You're no longer needed to stay in the hospital and here's your bus ticket and be on your way. That is very challenging. Mr. Fitz has met that and other challenges, including homelessness, trauma, and substance abuse problems, before becoming the activist he is today. Through peer support, 
he developed ways to cope, especially self-management of diet, exercise, and sleep, then went on to become executive director of the Oregon Mental Health Consumers Association. Though still living with disability challenges, Kevin also serves on the State of Oregon Consumer Advisory Council, the State of Oregon Addictions and Mental Health Planning and Advisory Committee, Unity Center for Behavioral Health Advisory Committee, and more. In May of this year, he was a recipient of a Trillium Family Services Keep Oregon Well Mental Health Hero Award. When advocating for mental health support bills in the Oregon legislature, Kevin points out that peer services help reduce costly psychiatric services, hospitalization, and incarceration. For an overview of the mental health consumer movement and its results by one of our own members, please welcome Kevin Fitz. Can you hear me? Is this mic on? Thank you. Um, so I just want to tell you, this is going to be sort of in three parts. Initially, just a little bit more of a bio about me, and then sort of a focus on some particular, the genesis of the consumer movement in Oregon, sort of how that started, and then a look at some issues related to public mental health. Um, and then, uh, so th an initial bio, some, some basic stats about public health, mental health, and then into a project, and then into some questions and some issues that we as advocates uh, deal with. So I'd like to tell people that my, if you thought about some of the work that Ralph Nader did, if Ralph Nader was focused specifically on behavioral health or mental health and addictions public policy, what would that look like? And that's what I try to use as my compass. I'm not, I used to be an individual services advocate and Janet or Tom didn't get, you know, their meds or, you know, didn't get their housing voucher and it did a lot of that. What I do particularly nowadays is system policy at the county level and the state level and previously at the federal level. So, <coughs> Anyway, so we'll go from there. I, I think that, that people may have some questions, because this can be a, a, an a issue that affects everybody, but why don't we try to keep those at the end, and I think we could have a robust discussion. So, so who am I? I was um, born in Eugene, Oregon in 1965. So according to Wikipedia, did the baby boomer end 64 and a half and the precipitous drop off of birth started in 65? So I'm a generation Xer, technically, according to Wikipedia. I don't have that information, uh, you know, that particular slide, but I have two sisters and one brother. Um, some of this stuff is consequential when you think about one of the buzzwords in mental health. It, you talk about the idea of nurture, nature. One of the ideas about nurture is what they're calling adverse childhood events, adverse childhood events. So, so some of that you, you may understand in my, my brief bio. My father was early into computer programming. His employer moved him around to work on projects that needed computer support. Uh, from Eugene to Corvallis to Northern California, back to Corvallis to Milwaukee, St. Louis, and Corvallis again. You've heard the term military brat. I was, my father was an officer in the military before he went to work for this engineering firm. But we moved around tremendously as uh, I don't think by the time I was in ninth grade, I, don't, I hadn't gone to the same school for more than uh, two, three years. So <clears throat> my parents divorced at age 13. My father was a heavy, heavy, heavy uh, drinker uh, by the time I was uh, 13 years old. And that was one of the reasons for my mother's divorce. Um, and I think also my mother was involved in a serious, serious car accident and broke uh, some of her cervical spine and caused uh, depression, chronic pain, on and on, surgery, surgeries, and th they got a divor they divorced. Caused my mother, my father, late stage alcoholic. My father came from a family of heavy drinkers and uh, folks that abused alcohol and could be considered alcoholics. <coughs> So my mom became, struggled with chronic pain and addictions to Valium and pain pills and Darvacet, and that made her sometimes uh, uh, incapacitated to, 
take care of her uh, children. <clears throat> so who am I? My parents got divorced at 13. My father, my, the um, alcoholic father, because he was, had the ability to pay for a lawyer, get, got custody of me and my, my brother, 14 months younger, my younger brother. My mother then moved back out to Corvallis. We were still living in Wisconsin. Started experimenting with alcohol at age 14. Started experimenting with marijuana at age 15. Um, bullied and beat up regularly in junior high school. Uh, this impacted me particularly. I, if you see my side profile, I actually have a crack right here in my nose. When I was the first day of school and I was invited to sit next to one of the popular girls and her boyfriend didn't like the new kid in town. And so he beat the crap out of me. And I was routinely the new kid in town, the new kid in town, which was challenging. I had enough of it dropped out of high school at age uh, 16. Between age 16 and age 18, I experimented with alcohol and marijuana and used to think if I could stay high or I could stay loaded, then I could tolerate this existential uh, s stress and challenging I was going through. My father said, <coughs> you get it out of the house you get a job or you join the military because I'm tired of your juvenile delinquency, your problems you're causing with us at the church, in the community, et cetera, et cetera. I joined the Oregon National Guard at age 18. I thought I was a pacifist. I was a complete pacifist. And they, and Corvallis, the Armory, had two choices. You could be an infantry, you could be an infantry person, or you could be a 94 Bravo, which is a cook. And I thought, hey, I could become a cook and come out and have a skill that I could use in uh, you know, in the regular world. <laughs> this incident, this next bullet point changed my life, the course of my life particularly. Up to age 19, 18, 19, the person I wanted to be, and this is going to be sound gross task to some of you, my two idols were Calvin Klein and Donald Trump. I wanted to be a very rich commercial real estate developer or I wanted to be a fashion designer. Um, I was very, that was what, that was the things that turned me on and I dreamed about. In 1984, while serving in the National Guard, I was dosed with a street drug called fencyclodrine, uh, commonly told, called angel dust or PCP. Um, <coughs> I went from sort of being uh, uh, involved in consensual reality to a highly paranoid psychotic state in the course of six hours. And that s held... Uh, until that started in early April 1984 and did not crack until April, August, middle of August 1984. Um, so during this, that year, I had my first of what be, would be 20 or so psychotic breaks, uh, suffering from intense delusions of persecution. People know what delusions of grandeur are. You know, I'm the smartest guy in the room. I know, you know, this better than military, you know, uh, et cetera. That's sort of delusions of grandeur where you're sort of convinced that you're the king you know, poobah, delusions of persecution, someone's out to get me. Someone's, the military's trying to get me with satellite rays, or, you know, the Pope is trying to send me secret messages, and he's trying to do me in. I, so I birthed that in an eight-hour period, going from on the way to morning cook school training, smoking a cigarette laced with PCP, and by 10 o'clock that night, I was floored. F what psychiatrist, my psychiatrist say, floridly psychotic. The ceiling was waving. I thought I could fly. I was talking like a movie character, and I was sure then that there was some apparatus underneath, the I underground the United States military that was trying to kill me. I left the base two days later and tried to hang myself with a coat hanger, called my mother in despair, and she talked me out of it, D then ended up going AWOL. <coughs> floridly psychotic across the country, sure that the military was tracing me the whole way, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Flew back to Portland, lived on my sister's couch for three weeks. Uh, I was paranoid of everybody. My sister, she would br bring me orange juice, and I was sure there was cyanide in it. I would buy cigarettes from the 7-Eleven, smoke one of them, and go back in and yell, you poison me. You're po you know, and I was not, um, I was v very fearful and very um, in an extreme state of suspiciousness and fearfulness. <coughs> Uh, then I spent, um, ended up in Corvallis in July or June of 1984. Spent a month, the, the MPs, when you go, when you break the law, when you are a military service person, they have rights over where you can go 24 hours a day. I left absent without leave, which was a crime punishable by military law. The military police 
and the, uh, gar the hospital folks from there up in Fort Lewis, they came down in a white van, <laughs> in white clothing, and put me in the back of the van and took me up to Madigan Army Hospital in Fort Lewis, Washington, where I spent, uh, where I spent about a month going through a battery of tests. And what they wanted to know was, was this, a dis was this disability caused you know, by your service? What was it caused by? Ultimately, they said, well, we're going to give you a general discharge and here's a bus ticket to get back to Corvallis. So anyway, ended up back in Corvallis, ended up in what used to be one of our state ho psychiatric hospitals, our public state psychiatric hospitals in Wilsonville, and they now turned that into a, a, a housing development called Villa Blue. But I was there um, for six weeks and um, ultimately moved out of that and moved into two different group homes. The, the key thing that changed my whole life was having this psychotic experience getting the diagnosis of schizophrenia and a drug-induced psychosis, and meeting this man, Garrett Smith. Garrett Smith was previously a alcoholic, a late-stage alcoholic, and they called it at the time manic depressive, bipolar. Um, he, he took a cab all the way from Seattle Airport all the way to Damage State Hospital four years earlier to get treatment for his bipolar disorder. He was a recovering alcoholic and a person who uh, identified as living with a, a severe mood uh, disorder. So he eventually became my mentor and changed the course of my life from wanting to be Donald Trump and uh, Calvin Klein to wanting to be Mother Teresa or Ralph Nader. Um, you can't see these because, the, because I did such a poor job of thinking about how the font. But basically this talks about some of the stuff that I have done um, in public policy. And one thing when you think, am I talking too loud? Okay, so when you think about public policy, um, and I think Ralph Nader first got on the scene talking about unsafe at any speed, the Corvair, the rear mid-engine. So that was an issue that affects a lot of car buyers. And then when you talk about uh, other things, you know, defaulty uh, radiator or air conditioner, that affects an awful lot of people. But when you talk about public policy regarding, you know, folks who have severe mental illness, it's a sort of a it's a niche in the mental of public policy in the mental health world, and then also the constituent, the service recipient voice, is also a smaller sort of niche of that. The, and one of the challenges that we have as advocates, and a friend of mine who runs Mental Health Association of Portland, he said, first of all, it's not sexy, it's not glamorous, it's terribly, terribly underfunded. Nobody wants to fund the voice of the consumer unless they have an objective of wanting to you to sell their product or endorse their product. And he said, you know, you're always scrapping t uh, to get support. So to this end, and thank God I had folks like Garrett, who, who in the 1980s was flying back and forth to Baltimore and to Washington, D.C. to participate on federal councils and advisory councils to testify in front of NIMH and talk about services for people with severe mental illness. Uh, so I got engaged in that, and in 1998 through 2001, uh, President Clinton's uh, mental health services arm uh, called SAMHSA, I was an advisor on a subcommittee made up of ex-patients and mental health consumers advising the federal government's policy on mental health services. And then a whole bunch of things local and regionally. Everywhere uh, public dollars connect to mental health in Oregon in this region and nationally, uh, probably been engaged in the last 30 years. And these are some of the things that I was proud of mostly through my career, but that's, uh, we got more important stuff to talk about. So um, some stuff about public mental health in Oregon, and I want to, I want to go from the macro uh, to the little bit more narrow so you sort of understand uh, what we're talking about. Um, people understand roughly the population of Oregon is is four million. Is, does that seem jive with what most people sort of understand? Right, a, sh a tad below four, four million people in Oregon? <coughs> Behavioral Health Collaborative Report, the director of the health department who last just was, uh, just resigned last week, she was there for three and a half years. She put together a collaborative report of 50 stakeholders across the state, psychiatrists, bureaucrats, politicians, family members, lawyers, and uh, and patients, uh, patient ad, uh, ex-patients and mental health consumers. 
I participated in that. One of the things in this report is through their data, they suggested that in 2015, the year of 2015, that over 750,000 Oregonians used behavioral health services. So we're not just talking about public, we're talking about private, commercial, could be going to therapy, could be taking uh, Adderall, could be going to a support group for breast cancer survivors who have depression, et cetera. But so 750,000 Oregonians, Oregonians used some sort of behavioral health services or addiction services in 2015, and with a population of 4 million people. <coughs> so more factoids. So in spring, this I think this is May data, this looks at, you can't see this, but this looks at all the different counties in Oregon and the 16 groups, the managed care organizations that manage both primary care, medical care, and oral care for people who are uh, public recipient, who are Medicaid recipients. So <coughs> there's been some debate about this in the press. But this, you can't see it, down here, 992,000, 992, almost a million people are Medicaid, are Medicaid eligible in Oregon. Um, probably a little bit less of that, probably 800,000 people are actually receiving some sort of services. That number, the million, some people change, move address, they get bumped off the rolls and it gets back on. But roughly, there's a one million any given time, there's almost one million people receiving Medicaid in the state of Oregon. So that's when you walk down a regular middle class town, if, if there is one, any such a thing anymore, you, you know, one in four of us may be uh, on Medicaid. If you go to Lentz, if you go to St. John's, if you go to Rockwood, probably see more Medicaid recipients. If you go to Charbonneau, Charbonneau or West Lynn or Lake Oswego, maybe, maybe a little less, but on average, one out of four Oregonians is on Medicaid. <coughs> so this is, so Medicare, and folks know that you, this is something that you get when you retire, uh, the health benefit, but also if you are a disabled worker and you apply to Social Security disability, aside of Social Security, and you're no, no longer able to work and you've worked long enough, you qualify for Social for Social Security disability insurance, and with that comes Medicare. So there are 800,000 people in Medicare, uh, in using me on Medicare in Oregon as of May this year. Certain number of those people, probably 15, 20 percent of those people who are on Medicare, are people who are under the age of 65 but are disabled. And the fastest growing, in the United States, the fastest growing Medicare recipient is that of the, those with behavioral health disorders. The rise of behavioral health disorders and the applications to Social Security disability. Um, what type of disability are people applying for? And it's in the behavioral health uh, world. I thought that was particularly interesting. So one million Medicaid recipients, 800,000 Medicare recipients. <coughs> so that's some broad things. Some of the things that really sort of impact what we look at in, uh, is a flashpoint for politicians, legislatures, and bureaucrats is opiate overdoses, suicides, and um, reducing the cost of psychiatric crisis services. So as, and this is uh, grim to talk about on Sunday morning, but as of August 1st, 422 Oregonians have committed suicide so far this year. <coughs> In two th this is the they, they don't have complete data yet for 2016, but uh, roughly their estimates is about 530. They thought it was dropping off uh, in 2012, 2014, uh, but they think, so 505 people died in drug overdoses and opioid-related deaths in Oregon in 2015. Some preliminary data from 2016 says that has increased uh, to maybe 530, 535, with most of those increases coming in the metro area <coughs> because of the opioid uh, street drugs and fentanyl. <coughs> so, some other sort of things that just have popped up on the radar regarding you know, the, our psyche and the world that we live in. Um, on uh, Last week, CNN published a uh, report, uh, published a, a news piece regarding a Journal of American Medicine about 
uh, one in eight Americans struggle with alcohol abuse. That's particularly interesting. I don't know if you know, but the Surgeon General is, no, is resigned, but the previous Surgeon General, the last who had the stead under Obama, talked about he thought one of the greatest killers out there and one of the greatest non-talked about issues was loneliness and isolation, and particularly for older single men. Uh, and if you dig any deeper, older single men, working class single men, uh, rural men and who are divorced who are also at greater risk for abuse of opiates and alcohol to, uh, so that, so loneliness is killing us is what uh, the Behavior Health Council talked about. And then this one just in the Atlantic Monthly came out about what is the use of smartphones doing to the sociability, the communication, the emotional rela relationalness that we have face to face with our peers, with our school teachers, uh, with our romantic partners. So it's a long, long, long article, but p very particularly interesting, uh, saying that we're gr growing a group of kids that are, you know, like trees without limbs in their of social ability to connect and to understand each other and their attention deficit disorder because they're glued into their uh, Instagram or whatever. So that's which impacts behavioral health for everybody, not just public sector. So, <clears throat> so there's some stuff about you know the macro. How many people are receiving public health services? If you take if 700, like we said, 750,000 Oregonians uh, sought some sort of mental health service, sought some sort of mental health services in 2015. Roughly, and it's hard to actually gain because some people get mental health services from their primary doctor and it's not checked in that particular box. It could be a primary care visit where he writes you a prescription uh, for an antidepressant or for Abilify. So it's, 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 it's a little bit more challenging uh, early on to say that, but approximately 200,000 people in the public sector 200,000 Oregonians, roughly, probably a 190,000 firm that we know of, including children, sought mental health or addiction services and problem gambling services and what they call the spectrum disorder services in Oregon on the public side, so, which, which is particularly interesting. So this impacts our idea of where we want to influence, what the needs are, how are we hitting this as far as where's the voice of the consumer and the recipient? So I want to tell you a story uh, about a particular project that was revolutionary at the time and this started in, it called the Mind Empowered in the late 80s in Oregon. Um, you, everybody has, has anybody heard of Lone Fir Cemetery? Anybody in the south? Yeah, southeast, okay. So, and then Hawthorne Boulevard, I'm sure we all know that. Hawthorne Boulevard was actually named after James Hawthorne who was the co-founder of the Oregon State Hospital for the Insane, <coughs> uh, which used to be in Southeast 12th Avenue. So I think this picture was taken, yeah, so in 1861 they, they opened it. I think it, it went for about 12, 15 years, and then they ultimately closed it. Uh, this was a private hospital. It was not a public hospital. It served everybody, but it was uh, privately held. In 1980, in, 1980, in 1888, they opened the Oregon State Hospital in Salem. 1883, they, this is the architecture of it and building it. And they actually tore all this down. All this is gone, but the brand new hospital, which, you know, back here looks like a, you know, like a maximum security prison. The front end of the new hospital has the, this, this building, and that's the museum. But the rest of it is, you know, super 21st century airlocks, cameras, you know, uh, very interesting, very interesting stuff. So um, in 1961, like I talked about Wilsonville, uh, Damage State Hospital opened, and that served a significant amount of people. Um, uh, uh, pl you know, they had one in Salem, the Oregon State Hospital. They had one in Pendleton and then they had one in Damish. The thing about Damish was, if you've seen the difference between the old Oregon State Hospital and the, you know, the, how clustered it all was together, and that doesn't really reflect it, but you can see, they didn't have a whole lot of grounds. 
But when you see Damage State Hospital, so here's Damage State Hospital, but you could go all the way out to here, and all the way out to here, and here, and the grass, huge, huge plains of grass. And um, this might get a little bit dirty, but they had what my <laughs> therapist used to say on the work, that some of the patients even had conjugal visit mattresses uh, out in the forest, out in the edge of the grassland. So if you became a level three or four, you could go to the swimming pool, you could go to the snack bar, you could go wander around out here and smoke, and it was l wide open, a wide open sort of space, and a, which was really, for me, which was uh, fortunate because I, I really liked the opportunity to go outside and, and um, I'm claustrophobic by nature. So that was Damage State Hospital. <laughs> you all know this, I'm sure you know this, Ken Kesey wrote, um, it's supposedly he was on a night shift working at a, at a psych ward or a um, hospital uh, psych ward in the early 60s and he was high on mescaline and, and peyote and was, that's particularly when it was said that he penned this, uh, started writing his novel, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, <laughs> which was instrumental in, you know, the idea of the inmates were on to run the asylum and we're not going to take it anymore. Randall McMurphy, I'm sh sure some of you have seen the film about the perfect sort of agitator, you know, don't take any crap, we're going to take things into our hands. So, so in the beginning of the patient movement, <coughs> things were happening in the 60s, you know, protesting the Vietnam War, M M uh, Martin Luther King was talking about economic justice, uh, uh, LBGT, Q folks were talking about some of their rights, uh, women's rights, etc. In Portland, Howie Hart came up from the Bay Area with a few other friends, started a group, uh, just, it wasn't a nonprofit, they just called themselves a, a front, the Insane Liberation Front. Howie Hart previously, in the mid-60s, was forced into a home for boys for treatment of his uh, mental health disorder. He jumped off the roof and uh, forever f fractured part. So he always had a particular, uh, he always had a, a limp. They called him Howie Hart because when he was homeless around campsites, he'd play beautiful harp music. So he is uh, one of the godfathers of what became the psychiatric survivors, the people who had experienced medicine and treatment but felt damaged by it, um, what they call you know, industry caused or physician caused, iatrogenic damage or through force and trauma, through coercion. Um, he was one of the initial leaders of the, of the, you know, what became now the consumer movement. This was, uh, this was, w this was our, you know, Nation Magazine has a newsletter or a, something that comes out. This was, or Mother Jones, this was ours in our movement, Madness Network News in the 70s. Printed from the Bay Area and then circulated around. Virginia is a, uh, I think she's now deceased, but she was a poet and activist in Oregon for 30 years. <coughs> so that, so we had that movement. So in, in 19, I, I was telling somebody earlier, in 1983, between 1983 and 1984, the federal government had one, uh, one, in, one cabinet secretary, one overseeing, it was called the National, under Health and Human Services, they, that dealt with health and mental health. It was called National Institutes of Health and then underneath it was National Institutes of Mental Health. That, through the influence of family members, consumers, survivors, they decided, let's put our research and our studies and, that's and, and our grants to do that over here, and let's have a particular focus on services, initiatives, and recovery birth what we call SAMHSA, uh, and, and out of SAMHSA was a group called the Center for Mental Health Services, which is actually the services arm for the federal government. In 1988, they were very early, and they, you know, three years into them, they came out they, with saying they were going to fund 10 pilot projects across the United States and give us your ideas. What do you think? We're looking for reform. We're looking for new ideas, novel ideas. It doesn't need to be evidence-based practices. We're looking to support some stuff and see what comes out of it. So it was called the Consumer Survivor Operated Self-Help Programs. Into, to that end, Oregon got a three-year grant, $120,000 a year, to fund a project called the Mind Empowered. So, and this sort of looks at, at, what it wa at some of what it was. This is a, um, <coughs> this is a talks about in the grant project. So the Mind Empowered was a project run 
from top to bottom by people who identified as li a lived experience of mental illness. So we couldn't say you absolutely have to be a consumer of mental health services to take this job, but we are looking to encourage those folks to apply. And if you do work here, people are going to presume it's a consumer-run agency, the director is in front of KATU and the Lamb a Week and the Oregonian talking about being a bipolar, having bipolar disorder, and lots of other folks are activists in the community. So it, what, we couldn't actually outlaw folks that weren't there, but people are pretty self-selected, and, um, and as far as we, I know, the first five, the first, for five years, I don't think anybody ever became employed that wasn't out of the closet, so to speak, about living with the mental illness. So this just talks about what it did. So when we talked about what it was, it was a community drop-in center. It wasn't where you went in and, you, and Dr. Don you know, gave you therapy or you went to see a psychiatrist and he told you where you were uh, you know, in the diagnostic code. It was, a supportive, it was basically a drop-in center that was open 10, 12 hours a day. And for folks that had no community and didn't find connection in the larger uh, Walmart, the larger conglomerate uh, nonprofits that are huge and have frustrated people who were non-compliant, difficult to treat, they didn't want to agree with their treatment plan, so they got kicked out. They ended up on our doorstep. So the Mind Empowered was the name of that group. And this just talks about uh, it grew. It got the attention of the then state mental health uh, commissioner saying, this is particularly interesting. I've and he was a recovering alcoholic, so you, I'm sure some of you know the idea of Alcoholics Anonymous. One of the things they say is, you, of course, you need a spiritual awakening, and that's, you know, that's, I guess, semantics, what you describe that as. But also the other part of it is one alcoholic helping another alcoholic is sometimes the difference that makes a difference. And then we had the Vietnam vets coming back from Viet the Vietnam War, and the only sort of comfort and com uh, uh, consolation that they got was from each other. So they were growing these mutual support self-help groups, um, which was particularly interesting. And then even later on, the growth of the breast cancer survivor group. So this rising up in one peer, one person with this particular lived experience, uh, giving comfort, support, and having community with somebody who had that experience. <coughs> they took note of that and thought, gosh, it would be interesting. We have a, some, a little bit of general fund uh, to the cost of, th one back then about a, ho a hospital bed a year was about $100,000 a year. So they had $300,000 and they said, instead of buying three more hospital beds, let's pilot this project. And I want to take all these folks that are showing up on your doorstep or getting kicked out of conventional services and let's do a case management program run by folks who have mental illness and do services for these people who are difficult to treat and who are combative or um, medically non-compliant. So it was called the Consumer Operated Management Project, and it was amazing. It was, uh, and was something that was emulated and looked at across uh, the world. NIMH, the, the science guys looking at research, they said, this is fascinating. So they added on another grant with uh, Portland State's Regional Research Institute to study, to say we have over here your consumers, your ex-patients, your survivors delivering services, and over here you have folks that I don't identify as having any lived experience. And let's compare on contrast, uh, you know, what the values and strengths are. Um, so anyway, you, so we'll just click over that. So they compared practices and they found, uh, they couldn't see that there was any uh, particular uh, uh, negative outcome for consumers. And they did suggest that it might help uh, encourage the growth of natural community which was particularly interesting. Unfortunately, they were, the program uh, was very well, um, well, the problem was that people who are, come from the point of an activist don't know how to run nonprofits, and so that was the challenge. So these folks would just go, so these folks are all instrumental. They came out of Mind Empowered. So uh, this was the gentleman who went to the na National Patients Conference funded by the federal government with the idea of what Mind and Power would be. They're all had been, these are all elders who then have influenced for the next 30 years what public policy, what uh, consumer services have been in Oregon. And so we'll just go through them um, uh, quickly because we want to get to some other stuff. But uh, this is my mentor. Uh, he, uh, he, 
did he was the director of that consumer survival project where they were case managers, which is um, pretty amazing. <coughs> so Mike and Scott and Danita and Becky, all good friends of mine. Um, and so, you know, this is about me. Um, like I said, so uh, I serve in the National Advisory Council Subcommittee on Consumer Survivor Issues for the Federal Center for Mental Health Services. So let's get on. So the, here's some stuff about me and the peer story continuing. I just want to show you, see if, if I can, how do I highlight the one video? I want to show you just a piece of some of my advocacy so you could see what I'm talking about. It's, so it's the first link. Um, yeah, yeah. The intersection of public policy. I think we started uh, late with uh, serious mental health to go challenges back. and um, uh, treatment regarding that in public policy and government and police and that sort of thing. To that end, I'm not, I don't want to go. Oh, uh, hi. Can you, everyone hear me okay? Is this thing on? Okay, good. My name is Kevin Fitz. It's Mayor Wheeler. I'm the Executive Director of the Oregon Mental Health Consumer Association. And we're particularly interested in the intersection of public policy and folks uh, with uh, serious mental health challenges and their um, uh, treatment regarding that in public policy and government and police and that sort of thing. To that end, I'm not, I don't want to go, I have opinions about COAB and it, but that's, this isn't, I, but I think moving forward, it's going to be your decision, uh, Mayor Wheeler, to what to do about it. Um, but I do have one constructive uh, suggestion for you on behalf, so just a figure, I was looking at it, in December, roughly 32% of the people who live in Multnomah County were qualified based on their income and disability for Medicaid, 32% of the county of Multnomah County. So what that means for the city of Portland, I'm not exactly sure. But what that tells us that the uh, state of Oregon estimated in, at the end of the year in 2015, 800,000 800, Oregonians sought mental health treatment and addiction services, 800,000 people. So, what, so the thing that I'm trying, and I, I was discussing this with Commissioner Udaley last night, what I would like to get a commitment from the city of Portland is the revolution that's taking place in mental health services across the um, across the state is to support our initiative for an amend for either a bill or an amendment to a current bill that's going to be heard on last week to promote uh, peer services throughout the coordinated care contract structure across Oregon. So every time you walk in the door and they say you can have a psychiatrist, you can have a case manager, you're also, because Medicaid pays for 60% of that from the feds, right now I think the time to strike is innovative. Clackamas County is putting to shame the rest of the state by how many peer services the folks they have. We're just asking uh, for your help to ask Christine to get on board saying we support peer services throughout your coordinated care organization for all peers. I got calls from Sarah at Mount Scott and Bahid saying, Kevin, do you have any peers? This guy needs some this guy needs some clothes. He needs to go to food bank. He needs to sign up for food stamps. And I said, you know, we got the money to pay for that, but it's been doing So yeah, so the, anyway, so that's some of the stuff that I do. Basically to intersect with uh, public governments that oversee um, uh, funding of uh, services, whether it's state, the county, and pushing the idea that. Good morning. Uh, uh, yeah, this is yeah, this is some other ones. I don't know if yeah, it's we it's three minutes long. I don't know if we basically I've been testifying in front of the Multnomah County, saying you should do what you used to do, and you had an individual with lived experience as an actual Multnomah County government employee, doing leadership, stewardship, mentoring, and supporting the voice of the customer. The challenge, like I said, is we're not talking about cars, and we're not talking about air conditioners, and we're not talking about you know uh, airplane miles. We're talking about public mental health policy, and the challenge that folks have to be encouraged to be engaged in policy if they're not sponsored by industry or by medical companies or pharmaceutical companies. It's very challenging to get a, f a seat at the table when you're talking about a system that spends you know a billion and a half dollars a year of t uh, taxpayer revenue in Oregon. So we try to intersect with them saying, you know, you need to hear the voice of the person who receives their s the, recipi the services and not just the advocacy funded AstroTurf groups. So anyway, so there's just a lots and lots and lots of that sort of stuff. So let's move on. Does that make sense? So we're talking about public policy 
to talk about you know uh, system issues and inclusion of the voice of the recipient and how important that is. Okay, good, good. So, um, so that's so those things that the creation of mind and power, the funding for that, peer services as a r right as a public uh, health recipient is some of the stuff that I really focus on. So here are th three particular issues that as a public policy advocate that we think about and are impacted by. Um, this was a look at a, actually a study and I, it came out uh, that in 2011, uh, the National Institutes of Mental Health, the research folks came out and saying, you know, folks with serious mental illness are dying 20 to 25 years earlier. What, what's going on with that? And there are many uh, different, as many different uh, opinions about that is, you know, depending on who you ask. And I was telling some people beforehand, you have understood, you know, the parable about who understands the, you know, the East Indian man, who understands the elephant. One person's looking at the trunk, the other person's looking at the stomach, the other person's looking at the behind, etc. And so they all have their particular piece. Um, this is one thing that we try to think about and try to raise. We're not doctors nor scientists, but we try to say, over here you have those people who are receiving public health services, people, uh, primary health services, and over here you have people who are also receiving pr public health services and mental health services. Some of the impacts, particularly, you've heard of the classifications of psychiatric drugs like anti-anxiety, which were the original ones of that would m you might think of would be Valium or Xanax, and uh, antidepressants like Zoloft, Celexa, uh, Prozac. Um, what pr particularly folks, the highest use uh, folks with severe mental illness are treated with what's called neuroleptics or antipsychotics. And you probably heard about this a long time ago, uh, Thorazine, Haldol, Stelazine, Melaril, which were first generations that came out of the 50s and some research on that. And so those were used, so those were used uh, aggressively. Um, some of the, and then we have second generation neuroleptics or antipsychotics. What the thing, we're particularly challenged, I mean, the, with anti-anxieties can cause addiction issues and some other things, lack of coordination and, and uh, some other particular issues. But one of the things that we think about that impacts our tribe particularly is the use of antipsychotic medications, second generation, even second generations, is what they do to the body's metabolism, particularly in how it impacts the p function of the pancreas and one's blood sugar, which can mean obesity, can mean uh, uh, damage to the kidney, the liver, or the pancreas. So when we look at these folks that are dying, the, so the patient's movement says, hey, look, it's, we totally understand the idea to use a pharmaceutical in in intervention to treat this person who is, ha you know, this person is having this mood and thought disorder. But it's not acceptable to be able to calm or quell the, f the fire in the mind, but then do a, a horrible damage to one's living organs, therefore short-circuiting their life. I have a, a neighbor who is now in uh, Good Samaritan ICU with kidney failure, uh, 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 congestive heart failure, and a whole lot of other things. And he, before he started taking his antipsychotic, neuroleptic, clozapine, he was 140 pounds. He's now 280 pounds, and he's 5'6", and his organs are failing at 59, and it's miserable. And s so one of the things that we say is, let's get back to the drawing board and hear the voice of the actual consumer and, and do better research on drugs that don't have such delirious, deleterious side effects. If Zantac or Vioxx or whatever, some of these general consumer groups and some of these drugs that they have pulled, if, if you got a drug as a general consumer you were unhappy with, they would be listening to the voice of the consumer. The problem in our area is that Medicaid or Medicare or the psychiatrist is looked at as being the purchaser and therefore the consumer, and the consumer is the usually without funding, is the, is the person before the train leaves the station chasing and saying, here are our experience. So this is an issue for people in the patient's movement. How are these side effects impacting our metabolism, our weight and stuff? And there's many different opinions about it. Poverty also is a huge one. So um, here's another one. And, I, and y we got, you saw, am I running out of time? 
Okay. So, yeah, two more points and then. So you saw in the debates when our new president had, was talking about, um, uh, who are those vultures? Uh, Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan wanting to gut the safety net and give it to the hedge fund billionaires. Sorry, I, I should have identified. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm educated by, you know, uh, my uh, poverty and I'm a Democrat. I'm a liberal Democrat or a left-wing rat. Okay, so I just wanted to offend you if I'm putting down your political heroes. So they wanted to, they wanted to roll back Obamacare because Obamacare is terrible and all that sort of thing. So I don't, I don't, I, the, the commercial side or the purchaser side and all, you know, and all those sort of things, I'm only particularly interested in what was the expansion of Medicaid and how that benefited, uh, how that benefited so many people, you know, 40% more people getting services who are poor and disabled in Oregon getting health care because of the expansion of Medicaid in Oregon. Some of the challenges though, so it's either are you for Medicaid, are you for the expansion of Medicaid, or are you wanting to roll it back? And so you're either in cam this camp or that camp. And some of the particulars are, we're, we are all for the expansion of Medicaid, and let's have me Medicaid and Medicare for all. I mean, we want to roll it out for everybody and, and uh, beef up the pack service package. But one of the interesting things below the radar is was the growth of the private Medicaid managed care companies. So previous to the expansion of Obamacare in uh, 2011, 2012 when that started, we had Medicaid managed care, but particularly most of those Medicaid managed cares and the behavioral health side were, the, were either county agencies who grew their own accounting and their services uh, structure to be a managed care organization, like Multnomah County had Verity. But we've seen the hyper growth of what are called private Medicaid managed care companies. So we have, 20, we have probably $28 billion every biennium that goes through Medicaid and goes out to our Medicaid managed care providers. And there's 16 of them in the state. Um, nine of them are for profit. So they're getting the Medicaid dollar that's going to serve the poor person, but they're chunking off, and the state allows them a certain amount of revenue and benefit and profiteering off of, and I don't think uh, JFK and Lyndon Johnson, when they created Medicaid, they would want to make a bunch of rich doctors in Coos Bay or Bandon, you know, ultra, ultra millionaires when they, you know, and so it's strange. Now, Governor Kitzhaber and his health care guy, they were in a rush to create this large structure across the state. Um, and, and the folks that were up on it, we had a, a semi, uh, almost half and half legislature, so they had to make compromises with some of the businessmen and uh, some of the doctors and stuff from the rural areas, so they came up with that. So we have private Medicaid managed care in Oregon, and, and so they do, they do a lot of good things, uh, and they should because the state keeps on them. But the challenge that they have is when we, as the patient, want to make them change, not only are they making doctors in Southern Oregon multimillionaires, they're taking 2%, 3% of their revenue and giving it to uh, some of the most formidable government relation lobby firms in the whole Northwest to come down to our little town hall public legislature in Oregon and work the place. And challenging because even though they'll tell me that they appreciate some of our initiatives, they don't want any mandates from the patient community or from the health care directors or the counties. These private Medicaid, these Medicaid managed care companies are huge. They're called coordinated care organizations in Oregon. They're hugely, hugely powerful in the debate about public services in Oregon. And they take some of their profits and some of their revenues and pay very slick, very polished, very well-connected uh, lobbyists to work Oregon, from Governor Brown to the chair of the Senate Health Committee and Human Services Committee. There are very few people in the Oregon legislature focused on housing and human services and health that don't get some significant funding, save for Se Representative Mitch Greenlick, which he, his, he does not take uh, money from industry, and he chairs the House Health Committee. But other than that, to his left and his right, his vice chair, everybody's campaign coffers are filled with Medicaid managed care companies' uh, money. So that's... So that's um, one of the issues that we are just, it's disgusting actually that they're profiteering off the public uh, dollar that way. 
So this talks about, this actually talks about Mitch. And Mitch had a bill saying, these should be trans, it's public dollars. This is all public dollars. This should be transparent. Your, your governing board meeting should be transparent. And we should transition, let's maybe take five years, but let's take the, let's m turn these into community-based organizations, nonprofit organizations, where they can't meet in secret, where we can tell them you, know, you can only spend this much on government relations and lobbying, and they have a greater accountability. You know, the difference between a for-profit is you're in the business to make as much mammon as possible, and if the IRS and the state of Oregon decide that you're a nonprofit, your agenda is to serve the public good, and the stockholders are the public. So Mitch is right on with his community-based idea that medicine works best is connected to the community. But poor Mitch uh, was waylaid by his vice chair and the lobbyists who said, hey, the spirit of this is fantastic. We don't want to move so fast that. Plus, we have the Trump administration threatening to remove our Medicaid. Let's just keep the status quo for now, and let's revisit it. Let's, right, we think we're moving too fast. So anyway, so that's so that's the issue, yeah. So th so those so and I think that's it. I think those are, I think that's it. So the so those three issues of, about psychiatric medication, some of the side effects of it, the um, how to have a voice when you're up against industry and their funding, and what does the public dollar? How does the public dollar promote you know paralysis or the status quo if it threatens the business practices? of the people who are running the show, the managed care organization. So I don't know if you can see this. This is my email, uh, Kevin, and these are, this is our, this is our, see our BAT logo? This is our organization, Oregon Mental Health Consumer Association, and some other ones that I find particularly interesting. Like the Mental Health of Portland, he's, all, he's very interested in the police abuse of folks with severe mental illness and some of the deaths. This is an amazing website. Um, by researchers, scientists, academics who are coming out of the woodwork to support uh, some of the publications, the podcasts, the TV that Mad in America is doing. Yeah, so anyway. Yeah, so let's thank Kevin first of all. For <laughs> if you have a question, please wait for a mic and then point it at your mouth when you ask. Thank you, Kevin. Nice presentation today. I felt for a while that as, l as long as we as a society make a differentiation between mental and physical health, that there's a stigma on the mental health side that doesn't need to be there. What do you think are the advantages and disadvantages of separating those two aspects of health versus making it a holistic approach? So as I said, when I'm talking about the Medicaid managed care, it used to be before Obamacare came on. You had your behavioral health and addiction providers over here in what are called a carve out. And over here you had your primary care, uh, primary care issue and oral care over here. And so there were two separate silos. State of Oregon said, we think integrated health is the way, the overall management is the way to go. Particularly, like say for example, I'm on Zyprexa and I'm having, and it's causing high blood sugar. My primary care physician, um, to have him learn about that and know about it. If he's siloed over here in his, own, uh, in his own organization or not connected, then we think that's bad. So the idea of integration of uh, particular services, and also it also is affected in helping to say, oh, you thought you had this? Well, you actually had a sleep disorder. You had sleep apnea, and that was causing high blood sugar, or that was causing you know, depression or w uh, sleep deprivation. So I think the integration of it is great, and I think erasing sort of unartificial walls is very necessary. Of course, keeping, you know, privacy and electronic records and all, you know, and all that ethics sort of thing, I think it's, that's, that's a great idea. No, the, uh, <clears throat> I interviewed uh, you last week. How'd it go? Did it go okay? Very well, <laughs> very, very pleased. And I'm, I'm glad to say that I, you're as good now as you were on the show, I think. Oh, oh thank you. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, Thanks. very good. Uh, question, people like yourself, do you, people have some way of uh, doing something about somebody who's terribly mentally ill, like the president of our country, Donald Trump? <laughs> so, Dr. Don, um, let me just throw this back at you. <laughs> what is the difference between the legit legitimate uh, mood or thought disorder and just an irrational actor. Uh, what is, the, is there a difference? The 
perhaps the degree or to the extent that the person is afflicted. Is the president of North Korea, he, is he a rational actor? Depending on who's the, making the assessment. Uh -huh, uh -huh. For me, I think the president of North Korea is a very smart, very wise man uh -huh. to resist the kind of domination that America has been uh, exercising throughout the world. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And he's absolutely rational. And I think his uh, citizens would vote him in uh, unanimously uh -huh. because of his resisting with every ounce of his being uh -huh. the domination and abuse that America has, has uh, done to the best sure. of humanity. Sure. Some people would say he was an irrational actor. Some people would say Paul Pot was an irrational actor. Hitler was, at the end, an irrational actor. Some people would say that our president doesn't suffer from a mood or thought disorder. He suffers from a disorder of malignant self-love and a character disorder of some sort. But I'm not a doctor. I don't know what you do about that. I think there are constitutional uh, clauses that says unfit to serve. I, I heard that when Nixon was at the end and he was drinking, talking to the oil paintings, that they were keeping the codes away from him at the very end of the disaster that that was, but I don't know. Uh, there's another thing coming in from the point of view of the consumer's view of health, uh, mental health care. Uh, this is the uh, talk space on the internet, $32 a week for mental health care over the, over the internet. Uh, we also... Uh, if you go back in the early history of uh, artificial intelligence, one of the first demonstration programs was something called Lisa, which was supposed to be a psychiatrist. Uh, that's probably going to come back sometime. Uh, w have you looked at the effectiveness of any of these things? Do you have a, a, a position on these as to whether either artificial intelligence can help in mental health and, and if internet delivery of mental health is any good at all? Mm -hmm. So, uh, I might be dating some of you. you guys remember the British psychoanalyst named Bowlby who did the experiments with the monkeys in the cages and some were real monkeys and others were monkeys uh, with a cloth and a wire cage having the bottle. You know, they deprived them of the, of the actual mother and then put them in there and sooner or later, they started clinging to, uh, you know, effective bonding or attempting bonding with this metal cage with this carpet over it and the melt coming out. Um, to the, uh, I am familiar with Talkspace. I'm also familiar with Wobot. I'm also, I, I just got appointed last week the chair of a subcommittee at the State of Oregon Health Department called Tools, Technology, and Access. And what, we're very interested in that. We just, I was telling her yesterday, Talkspace, what is it, 30, did you say $32? Yeah, $32 a week. Somebody is, I mean, they're, you know, they want to be the uh, Xerox or the Kleenex or the Uber, the first uh, identified. But I think there's going to be tremendous uh, shuffling and moving forward with that. There's also a, a, an app called Wobot where it, you check in with it, how are you feeling right now, et cetera, et cetera. So it's hard to know, but we're interested in that particular uh, interested in that particular thing. One of the things related to artificial and, tech and high technology, there was a, there's a neuroleptic pill that had a, a transmitter that would, that would signal a bracelet uh, sending a text to your doctor. I have now successfully ingested my psychiatric pill and I, therefore I am, I am compliant today and put that in your treatment plan. Now I don't know whether it actually made it to market, but FDA was actually looking for it. So I don't know, some of my friends have actually thought that they had had chips embedded in them and have harmed themselves to try to remove the implant. I'm not sure for folks who are suspicious of government or, you know, authority, to how that is going to work, and particularly around privacy. But I also do find it kind of interesting that I, you know, like a mindful ask, have you taken the time to breathe today, you know? Um, so it's a brand new world, and we, uh, I, we're not endorsing anything, but it is particularly interesting. And we hope that the, you know, that the user base, that us as consumers, you know, have a great uh, say in it. $32 a week for somebody who's on food stamps and low income is ridiculous. But uh, I think, you know, I think that might change, but it is a very fascinating. Yeah. Um, <coughs> I just wanted to ask you about... Um, Trump and there's a, a, a I received over the internet from a friend of mine um, 
documentation showing that a certain group of psychiatrists and psychoanalysts, I don't know much about this stuff, so I'm going to be truthful, um, are going to uh, uh, have a committee d deciding what kind of crazy Trump is. And my question is, who the hell cares what you call him? Obviously, he's narcissistic. Even someone like me knows that. And he is, um, let's focus on what he does, which is steal a hell of a lot, and forget about calling him a name. So f from a practical standpoint, uh, like we see a lot of folks talking to themselves on the street, what does it matter what we call them? Sometimes it's, it's effective in getting them help, uh -huh. so I can uh -huh. understand that. Uh -huh. but oh, my question is, um, for pr people like Trump, is it really um, productive to try to figure out what kind of crazy he is? Well, I, I don't know. I, if they want to make it grounds for removing him, uh, I don't know if you know, but there was a psychiatrist who wrote a book called George Bush on the couch and got a bunch of blowback of how could you diagnose this person wasn't in your office. Um, I'm not really sure about that. I don't, for folks uh, who live in poverty, who uh, suffer uh, voices, hallucinations, uh, horrible emotional despair, suicidality, to talk about a person who's always, who's transfixed by his own image and is worth nine billion dollars, it's hard for me to see what kind of crazy that is that makes any sort of sense to you know, us uh, 750,000 Oregonians. I mean, we, well, I, my, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a junior clinician, so what I was taught by, by a, a psychiatrist early on was the distinction of what they used to clarify as is access one mental health disorders, and then what we call access two, and Dr. Don could speak about this for hours, but particularly in access two or ones we would call narcissistic, sociopathic, borderline, all of those sort of things. Character and moral issues and the development of that are diff I differentiate that from, hey, a serious mental illness is a mood or thought disorder, you know, like schizophrenia, like bipolar disorder, like severe, severe depression and, and, and other things. But having narcissistic, uh, malignant self-love and being crazy on having, you know, like the dog that goes to the dog park and has to urinate on everything to mark his spot and give his opinion about everything. I think he's a nut, ch I think he's a, I think he's a, a loose cannon and I, I'm, I'm concerned about his cognitive state being, you know, terribly fractured and his ability to even speak in full sentences. I don't know, but he's damaged goods as far as an effective, uh, you know, public servant. So. Did you have a question or, or were you... Uh, my name is Norman Pleaser. Um, I was told I'd never be off of Thorazine back in 1970. Uh, I went off of it gradually, which I think has to do with recidivism. If you stop something suddenly, you're going to have problems. I don't th know whether that's been addressed in the, uh, for lack of a better term, industry. But uh, um, a guy named uh, Dr. Dixon taught me a type of mindfulness and that was learning how to relax. And one of the things that I have been telling people is the first drug of choice is actually uh, adrenaline because like you spank a child or you have an adrenaline response. So that ends up being the first drug. So I don't know how those things would be addressed to you. So w I have a neighbor who had a psychotic break in 2001. 2001, he had his last psychiatric crisis of a sorts where he was uh, possibly a danger to himself or others or incapacitated to feed himself or bathe himself or get sleep. And that was, he was hospitalized. It's 2017, every day he has been on 350 milligrams of a powerful, powerful, powerful neuroleptic, high, high doses. He's 315 pounds, and he has, his doctor says his obesity is causing terrible sleep apnea. We uh, su suspect he was 160 pounds all through his youth, all throughout his 20s and late 20s, and when he started taking this, he, he gained 160 pounds. He has not been able to lose it, has not been able. So the challenge is we think that they want you to take this $10 pill four times a day for the rest of your life, 
because that puts my, you know, if, you, if it was like the new hepatitis drug that you only take for six weeks, but you pay $40,000 for it, they better make their profits right off the top. But if we can get you paying, you know, three or four times a day for a $10 pill, then there's no incentive for us to try to get to help you uh, titrate or, you know, reduce slowly off such medication. In the patient's movement, there are folks that have written books about it, that do webinars, that talk about it over and over again. When I got tried to get off my neuroleptic, my, uh, um, uh, my Zyprexa, my, I tried to do it the same day I s decided to quit drinking and blowing tons of marijuana. I then could not sleep for 10 days and I was through a new kind of hell, a sober existential hell. Only then my doctor said, you can't, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. Why don't you try to get over the alcoholic shakes and calm down some of the paranoia and then look at metering, like you said, metering down on this sort of thing. And then we'll look at, you know, that, but let's, let's, you know, I, I want you to get back on it because it's helping you rest and you're running, you're running on adrenaline and fear and you're burning out your motor. And so uh, that's a, I think that's very important. But the challenge is, is that we don't have the ability to put this out there because no one is paying for our government relations, our marketing, our ability to just do <laughs> mediocre PowerPoint presentations. You know, we, it's just, uh, it's a, our, my group, I'm still, I'm still on public disability and I'm a volunteer, uh, which in some ways is good because we don't take any government funding so we can, you know, diplomatically criticize whoever we want to criticize. But I hope that this was useful. I was telling, it is not regularly that I talk to, well, such a highly intelligent crowd as yourself, except the person in, over here in the front seat. Yeah. No, he doesn't exist. I'm just kidding. But that I don't talk to a broad crowd. I usually talk to legislators or other patients or industry folks most of the time, or houselessness folks. So it, I was quite nervous about it. But I also want to thank my partner, who is uh, just an amazing eye for editing and decorum and stuff, uh, Karina, who helped me sort of put this together because I procrastinated the last minute. And I want to apologize to Marcia for not being more clear with my presentations and my bio. It is like trying to chew off just a piece of the beast and talk about it because it you know, could go on and on forever. So thank Excellent. you very much. Excellent. You really appreciate it.